Hey guys, welcome to Cricket Fanatics Magazine. This is your daily show. I'm your host, Khalid Noirin. This is my co-host, Aditya. And today we're joined by John Duplessis. We're going to be just having an open chat with him about T20 cricket in general, particularly batting in the in the top order because uh, the, the top three uh, top four is very important in T20 cricket. And myself and Aditya speak about it so many times on the approach and the mentality and the way you do things. I mean, being a wicketkeeper as well with that type of insight, we can get a lot from John on all of this. And I, I really want to just get deep with you on your career, on yourself and your development of your T20 game. So first and foremost, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for, yeah, so I hope it's going to be a good one. So I'm very excited about this one. Let's get straight into it. Jean, let's talk about SWD, um, uh, new structure. And the new structure is obviously giving opportunities to many guys that maybe never got the opportunity before. Now, first and foremost, you guys are now, all your games are on TV. So the whole of South Africa gets to see you play. Let's talk about the, the T20 setup, your development in the T20 game over time. Um, we know your record with the Sander 19. We, we know your, your record with provinces as well. But I want to know about your T20 game. Moving from school and into professional cricket, just give me some insight into the T20 game and how your game has developed since the start, since you started playing T20 cricket. Yeah, I think there's actually a lot to talk about there. Um, I think the one thing, just reflecting back on it, I think especially at school and even at semi-pro cricket, um, you'll see a lot of the younger guys' records reflecting that we don't actually play that many games uh, of T20 cricket. So um, my first real exposure to T20 cricket at the highest level was um, in my grade 12 year where I got to play in um, uh, the SWD side with guys such as um, Dan Villas and um, Dan Pato and so on. So, um, yeah, I think that that really opened my eyes in terms of the types of skills that I needed to develop to to able to up my game and to actually become a match match winning type of batsman. Um, obviously, when I got into that side, I was batting a little bit lower down, so my role was slightly different. But um, yeah, I've had to develop a lot of um, skills specifically with power hitting and also just try and figure out where it would be best for me to bat according to my um, my strengths. So. Yeah, it's, it has come a long way. Um, I've been putting a lot of hard work in over this winter season, knowing that there's a lot of t more T20 um, exposure for us this this season. So, yeah. So, so where do you feel most comfortable to bat currently with your current skill set? Yeah, to me, I see myself having to bat in, in the top three. Um, that, that power play um, is very important, as you alluded to in the, in the beginning of the interview. Um, it it suits my strengths of of hitting gaps and piercing the field of of especially the base bowlers, um, so that's where I feel most comfortable. It also allows me to set myself up for the back for the back end. Given that uh, given that you talked about your your strengths of playing in the power play, but assuming you do you do get set and you're able to cross the twelve to thirteenth over mark. How are you then able to switch your game from being a top three player to then being a finisher? That's a very good question. I think the most most important thing for me, and I know a lot of um, coaches and players speak about it, is is identifying matchups um, which suit your strengths. Um, a type of bowler, whether it be a seamer that hits the wicket hard or tries to tries to execute a certain death bowling skill that. That you can counter um so i i depending on the flow of our innings not just my own innings um i identify certain overs where i'd like to maybe score a little bit faster um and i identify bowlers that i know might be a little bit more difficult to score against so that's more or less how i try to make the transition i feel often that if you get 
one over where where it goes according to plan and your matchup works out then it automatically increases your batting intensity and and temperament um and from there on you just need to to keep that flow and that momentum going again you you talked about matchups uh, so i was wondering um, in this in this modern era of t20 cricket how much does data play a role in the way that you structure your innings or as as captain uh, the way you plan your uh, your field placements and bowling options and so on um i'd say quite a lot um for me as a as a batsman i'd probably um use it a little bit more um the fortunate thing is we even though we we are a second division team i personally have played against a lot of the guys that we come up against so it's not necessarily just data it's a, it's a mixture of playing experience and and statistics or whatever you want to call it um in terms of my my captaincy with with bowling and fielding positions it i would say it's a little bit more um focused on our bowler strengths so not necessarily just trying to trying to plug the the weaknesses of the batsman but rather bowling towards our strengths um obviously taking into con- uh, the conditions into account so the next thing i want to do want to ask you is about balance of sides now in t20 cricket we talk about it all the time you know conditions play a part uh, a lot of things confidence um, plays a part let's talk about first and foremost about the balance of the side and your role as a captain in, in selecting sides and for specific conditions i mean it will obviously change according to where you play definitely um i obviously as captain you do have a certain amount of input um i think for instance with this past weekend we had in kimberley it was a little bit of uh you mentioned statistics as well um it was a little bit of an interesting one going there with only a few games i think at the beginning um they were showing on super sport how there were only seven matches or seven data points that they were able to pull from um and the data was actually completely skewed where it almost said that batting second was was the way to go and it almost proved to be the opposite um when we were there this weekend so um yeah it's it's a difficult one as you said uh, form and confidence almost makes more a bigger difference nowadays than just statistics and general um ground trends um but yeah i i do have a bit of a say in that and um obviously work closely with the coaches and try and try and get the best squad together so how do you identify when a, when a, when conditions and a pitch is is right for chasing or right for uh, for batting first how do you guys identify that i think it largely depends on whether it's a morning game or afternoon game um obviously when you're playing an afternoon game you have the um the luxury of of watching a little bit of the morning game seeing how it unfolds um especially in kimberley or where we played now heat and um the dryness of the air um makes or plays quite a big factor um we we tend to look at ground conditions as well so faster outfield smaller outfield um size and dimensions of the boundaries as well so yeah i, th- I think that <laughs> covers a vast array of of um conditions um that i mentioned there but it's a bit of a combination of things and as well i think once you get a trend going that that works for you it's it's easier to to back your strength um as a as a team you know given that you have a say in in uh, putting a squad together uh, what's your view on on how uh, the ideal t20 team should be composed you know given that so many teams now in in the ipl and internationally are sort of batting till 10 and um, they have six or seven bowling options as well so what's your view on that i was actually asked um during the tournament by one of our coaching staff if it's if it's difficult for me having so many bowling options on the field and i almost and i almost said to him no it's it's actually so much better just to have all those options could you never know there's with t20 cricket um there's always bound to be one bowler that that goes for a couple of runs um so you need you need that extra option 
I think you mentioned that trends in international cricket. I've noticed that a lot of sides are going more with with all rounders. Um, just to give you that extra seamer seamer option or seamer spin option with the added strength of a batsman, I think there's a lot of value in in all rounders. Um, I think you'll notice that we actually played most of our games with three all rounders or three seeming all rounders, which um, helped a lot with our balance. Um, in terms of just mentioning spin, I would say I I prefer having two spin options on my side. Um, I know there was a lot of chat in our camp specifically, um, whether um, just noticing how, for instance, uh, the other teams went about it, maybe having one frontline spin option and having more seam. Um, I prefer to have two two frontline spinners. It just gives me a little bit more option. Just coming coming back to one guy might potentially travel, especially on a smaller ground like like Kimberley. Um, so that doesn't specifically answer your question, but a balance of good all rounders and and two two spinners minimum for me. Do you have uh, specific players that you've modeled your game on or that you look up for inspiration? I mean, as a guy from South Africa or an aspiring cricketer from South Africa, you have to look at someone like AB. Um, obviously, he's a he's a bit of a, a freak in terms of his natural ability. So it's difficult to model your game on someone like that. Um, it's always good to aspire to be like that. But I think um, other players just to, to think about is um, players that are slightly more longer format specific traditionally, um, like Kane Williamson and Virat, um, that would have started off or are very technically sound, but have modeled their game to be able to play T20 cricket. Um, that kind of transition, I admire a lot. Um, so so I tend to to watch them quite closely in terms of their boundary hitting options and how they pace their innings, because they, they tend to bat in a similar position to me as well. So. What I would like to ask you actually is um, in T20 cricket, you, you're sitting with a situation at the top of the order where you where a lot of batters have this other combination of one attacker or one anchor in a way that bats through the innings. But you do have some modern day eras um, teams where there are two full out attackers um, that can just like a Quinton de Kock, two Quinton de Kocks basically at the top of the order that can just punish you in the power play. What is your thoughts on that and, and what the role should be of your, your opening batters in specifically in T20 cricket? Do you have maybe a, a mentality for different roles for one and two and maybe then that affects your role at number three? Or what is your thoughts on that in that top order positions? Good question. <laughs> um, but... I think it largely depends on on your squad makeup. I mean, you mentioned there you, you sometimes get opening pairs where both guys go really hard. I mean, just thinking about um, the IPL currently, if you think about um, the Knight Riders with, um, you mentioned Shubman Gill and his new new opening partner where they just seem to go hard every, every game um, and then kind of backed up by someone that might pace the innings a little bit slower. Um, I don't, I don't think there's necessarily one right way of doing it. Obviously, otherwise everyone would be doing it the same way. Um, yeah. But in our case, I think we we have guys that, that are able to complement each other in that top three, which is important. Um, I think those guys need to be, especially the guys in the power play, need to be very versatile batsmen. Um, they need to be able to read those conditions and really capitalize on, on it if it is in the favor of of the batsman so yeah i wouldn't say there's a necessarily a, a prescribed way of playing i just think the the word i would use is maybe people or batsmen that are adaptable um you know we uh, we've we've heard in, in in recent times about um the challenges in south africa to play quality spin bowling uh, where do you think that's that's been at in this competition you know, what's what's the degree of confidence in your view that batters have in playing quality spin bowling? I think there's definitely been a, a trend developing um, amongst South African batters that we are really trying to um, 
improve, especially our attacking of the spin bowlers in, in T20 cricket. I think, um, I think the level of confidence is definitely improving. I think one thing that we are not challenged with as much in South Africa is is a mystery spinner, if you want to call it that. Um, a lot of quality leg spin or mystery spin is not something that we are exposed to a lot at, at our level. So I think there's always room for improvement in that. And I think, unfortunately, that's maybe the one, one place where we come short. But I think if you can nail down your basics against against the more traditional version of spin, um, then it becomes easier going up, up a level or two. So guys, thanks a lot for tuning in. Thank you a lot, John, for coming on the show and chatting to us. I mean, this is why we have players like him in the system, because if you listen to this interview, the insight that he's given us today is, is, is amazing. For a 22-year-old captain, for a 22-year-old South African cricket to speak, uh, to speak to us like the way he has, I think it's remarkable. So well done, John, for this interview, and, and good luck for the rest of the tournament as well. To all of you guys watching, this is the type of content you will be getting from Cricket Fanatics magazine more regularly. So go ahead and subscribe to the main issue of the magazine. Every single month, we bring out a monthly magazine. 100% free for all of you guys to, to go and subscribe to and read every single month. Well, there's videos in there. It's interactive. There's even a crossword puzzle. So go ahead and download the latest issue of the magazine. Top right of the corner, there's an eye. Click on that eye and you'll get the free download button for that as well as in the description if you can't find that eye. So thanks a lot to everybody for watching. And we'll see you guys again tomorrow with another daily show. Take care, everybody.